Okay, I think right now we will start our um, today's uh, webinar. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to our CIT Northern Alberta section NACIT's March uh, webinar today. And my name is Zheng Luo, and uh, I'm the elected uh, NACIT's president in 2022. And currently, I'm working with the Stantec Consulting as a transportation engineer in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Stephen Garner, our CIT's district administrator, to help us uh, set up this section. Um, this is our first webinar by using CIT's GoToMeeting platform. And in the past, we were using the different platform, but definitely we want to be consistent with uh, the other uh, sections, uh, webinars. Um, definitely, this is a great option. And uh, I'm also very happy to see we have a lot of... Uh, uh, attendees today uh, because this is definitely a very interesting topic and also I would like to thank our section's vice president Anika, student chapter liaison Davish, our section's uh, treasurer and uh, secretary Bogdan and our past president Daniel to help promote this event in our monthly newsletter, LinkedIn, Twitter and section webpage and we will continue to use this platform for our future webinars. Um, before the start of this uh, today's webinar, I would like to see something about our logistics stuff. So uh, definitely hope uh, everyone during this whole section, please, uh, when our speakers are, are presenting, please turn off your camera and audio. And uh, um, and then definitely after the section, the presentation, and uh, feel free to uh, leave your um, questions in the chat box and we will have a Q&A session after the presentation and also please feel free um, leave the questions and we will uh, catch uh, as much as we can um, and also all the questions will be shared with our speakers and we will have some follow-up um, answers in the future. Um, okay let's talk about this uh, today's presentation. So in the past month I was very lucky to get a chance to connect to two outstanding professionals who are working with uh, Mobicon, an outstanding international consulting company with uh, expertise in the field of uh, active transportation planning and design in these offices in Canada and the US. And both of the speakers um, for today's presentation, um, we have a great connection. So now let me introduce our speakers and their presentation topic. Uh, today's presentation is about from Netherlands to North American best practices in multimodal integration. So many people know that the Netherlands for their cycling culture and world-class bicycle infrastructure. So what is well, uh, less well known is uh, Dutch expertise in multimodal transportation, putting people both on food and on bike with an efficient public transit system. So today's webinar will cover the international expertise in the planning and the design elements that make our for seamless connections between active transportation and the public transit. And some of the themes addressed will include active transportation networks and safe, uh, safe street design, station access by food and bike and bike parking facilities. And also this webinar will include some examples in Ottawa and San Diego to learn how these elements are being applied in North American uh, context and discuss ways to further develop multimodal transportation hubs. And uh, let's talk about our two speakers. Uh, first one is Wayne Gong, uh, PNG. And I know Wayne uh, several years ago when Wayne is working with our uh, Edmonton, Northern Alberta's uh, section, um, CIT section. So, and also currently we're both the members of TEC's Active Transportation Integrate, uh, Integrity the Committee. Um, and we work on something together. So Wynne is an uh, integrated mo uh, mobility specialist in Mobicon's North American office in Ottawa. And uh, in the past uh, uh, several years, uh, main work for public section uh, sectors uh, in Western Canada. And uh, he also worked on uh, several uh, outstanding projects. Uh, one of the Wynne's uh, proudest uh, accomplishments includes uh, planning and de de uh, delivering Edmonton's first uh, residential protected cycling network, spanning sev seven neighborhoods here in the city. And uh, we also uh, spearheaded various co corridor and neighborhood-wide projects across North America by providing 
uh, holistic and context-sensitive sens mobility solutions. And um, his in-depth understanding of the project life cycle and evidence-based approach enable him to work if effectively with the stakeholders to address their concerns by applying Dodge-inspired best practices. And the next speaker is Mary Albeck. Uh, Mary is an integrity mobility consultant with Mobicon, and she has a background in active transportation planning from Denmark and the Netherlands. And Mary has over a decade of ex uh, experience in adapting international best practices to work with, within a local context. Since 2011, she has supported the communities in becoming safer and more bike and pedestrian friendly through a leading edge projects around new mobility and shared spaces, community lead uh, led design, the 20 miles per hour zones, complete street and safe and active school zones. And Mary has worked on the FHWA bike facility selection guidelines, developed a tactical urbanism workshop series around community-led solutions for safer streets and is currently leading Mobicon's role on the NCHRP uh, guidebook for urban and the suburban cross-section uh, roadway re uh, relocation. And she is a graduate from University of North Carolina and leads Mobicon's U.S. office in Durham, North Carolina. So now, Steve, uh, Let's uh, let me hand over uh, to our two outstanding speakers and uh, start our today's webinar. Thank you. Uh, great. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, Jung, so much for having us. Um, yeah, I'm Mary, and uh, as mentioned, I, I lead our U.S. office out of Durham, North Carolina. Um, but we're a small team, so we get to work across uh, across the border. So um, I get to work in both the states and Canada. Um, and again, joined by my colleague Wayne Gong in our Ottawa office. Um, and before moving to Ottawa, he was with the city of Edmonton. Um, one of my favorite projects uh, was in Strathcona County. Um, so we, we do feel quite partial to um, uh, to Northern Alberta. Uh, now, Mobicon's uh, head offices are in the Netherlands, uh, where we work with um, sort of a, a broad range of transportation services, uh, from traffic safety research to public space design, um, to getting bicycles back on the curriculum in schools. Uh, in our North American offices, uh, we work to adapt best practices in these areas, um, some of the same best practices that have helped the Netherlands become uh, renowned for its transportation systems. Now, uh, what we found is that quite often in North America, if people find out that Mobicon is originally a Dutch company, it sort of instantly clicks like, oh, you must know something about bikes. Uh, you know, so please, please help us uh, figure out this protected intersection or protected bike lane, um, which, which we absolutely love. Um, but as Wayne and I are both integrated mobility specialists, we also think it's quite important to view active transportation as part of the bigger picture. Uh, so we're particularly excited to be here excuse me, talking to you all today about best practices in multimodal integration and, and have the opportunity to, to explore this topic. Uh, so today we're going to be dividing this presentation into three main parts or chapters. Uh, first, we'll talk about our approach to integrated mobility, what we mean by that, as well as a very short history on how the Dutch earned their position as leaders in the field. Um, then we'll look at multimodal networks. Uh, so what decisions can we make on the network level um, that can help set the stage for a more truly multimodal community? And then lastly, we'll look at the hardware. So what are some of the street level changes uh, that can be made to help facilitate a safe, comfortable, multimodal atmosphere? Uh, so jumping into the Dutch approach to integrated mobility with a, a quick historical overview here. Um, on the next slide, the one with the, uh, the typical looking uh, Dutch cargo bike. Uh, so the Dutch are known for their high numbers of active transportation, particularly uh, when it comes to cycling, of course. Um, nationwide, they've got about a 25% um, bicycle modal share. That number jumps up to 60% in urban areas. Um, that hasn't always been the sort of bicycle friendly um, wonder place that we know it as today. It, it very much followed the same trajectory as uh, North America with the creation of car dominated cities. Uh, people are just as enthusiastic about driving there as they are here. 
Um, in the 1970s, though, that that changed. Um, the two things, or one one thing, really happened uh, first. The the public reached the sort of the end of their tolerance for people dying in traffic, um, particularly young children, uh, which sparked the campaign "Stop Child Murder." Uh, this did also coincide with the oil crisis, and it was sort of the, the culmination of these two things that uh, kicked the government into gear and they started rethinking their approach and, and really planning for all modes. Um, and eventually the, the safety tactics that they started to implement uh, developed into what we now know as a safe system or, or vision zero approach. Uh, so it's it's not just uh, transit and active transportation that have benefited from that more multimodal approach. Um, Waze, maybe, yeah, I'm sure you all have heard this before, but uh, Waze has sort of identified the Dutch as some of the happiest or most satisfied drivers in the world. Um, so it's not just active transportation at the uh, expense of, of people driving. It doesn't have to be the, the us versus them. Um, so we like to think that there are some lessons that can you know, that can be learned in terms of how we reach a more a multimodal society. So when we talk about integrated mobility, uh, it's, it's often understood most traditionally in the sense that, okay, I can take my bus, uh, excuse me, I can take my bike to the bus and then I can either park it or load it onto the bus. Then you hop off the bus and you walk or maybe you take an e-scooter um, or perhaps it's as simple as having one card uh, you can use that gives you access to all the modes that a city has to offer. And that is integrated, of course, um, and, and Wayne's going to talk more about the street level amenities, but we also we like to think about it as part of a larger system um, or in the context of integrating mobility on the network level. So on the next slide, we'll see these sort of four different puzzle piece factors. Um, so the first thing we think about are the people. Uh, so who are the people in a given space? Um, who's, who's using it? Uh, what for what purpose what activities are they participating in this space uh, and then after considering the people and the, the activities the land use we get to what types of transportation modes are ideal to meeting those the needs of those people and and those activities um, and then lastly is where the infrastructure comes in so what's the type of infrastructure that's going to then accommodate these people places and and modes Another way I, I like to think about it is that every street tells a story and hopefully it's a good story and that it's designed to reflect what's going on around it. So streets that tell the same story as the space around it are more intuitive, uh, which presumably means you're going to get better behavior and well behaved road users are um, basically what we're going for when we're trying to create streets for people. Uh, so I, I like to think about downtowns, this, uh, you know, any any sort of given downtown, lots of shops, restaurants, uh, areas that should kind of largely feature people on foot, or at least people moving slowly if they're biking or driving through. But what we see a lot of times is that the design of the road doesn't actually change as it hits that downtown more built up area. It'll remain, you know, four, five, sometimes six lanes. So I'll, I'll show you all an example. Um, this is from Lillington, North Carolina. Um, I don't feel too bad showing this example because I know they're they're working on fixing it. So this is the, the heart of downtown. Um, it doesn't really look like downtown. Uh, this is Lillington's Main Street. It's even called Main Street. Uh, Lillington is a, it's a quaint little town. It's a college town. There's a, a river, lots of recreational opportunities. They've got nice little restaurants. Um, a, a good little bike shop, um, but Main Street is also a truck route and there's currently uh, 30,000 cars per day, um, including quite uh, quite a lot of trucks. Uh, but it, so it's not actually pleasant to sit outside at any of these restaurants because of the noise pollution. And what's interesting on this road is um, about a mile out, the speed limit will start to change. It'll drop from um, from 45 down to 35, down to 20, but the design of the road really stays the same throughout the entire corridor. Um, so what they've, they've done here is they've really overemphasized traffic flow over creating a sense of place. Uh, you can see sidewalks in the uh, in the, the street view, but it, it doesn't actually feel safe or comfortable. Um, so people actually get their steps in, um, uh, get their workout in. They do laps in the Walmart parking lot. 
Uh, so here we've got, you know, we have these shops and restaurants telling people to move slowly, like begging them to, to stop and hang out. And then we have the road urging people to move quickly saying, yep, there's nothing to see here. Keep, keep on trucking. Um, so again, we don't have the after of this yet, uh, but the town is working on it. Uh, so to get a, a view of a, a before and after, we'll, we'll jump over to the Netherlands. So uh, this street is Harlemerstraat in Amsterdam. Um, it's a street that a lot of people go to uh, to shop. They go out to eat. There's quite a few hotels. Um, so it's it's also a touristy area. Basically, if you were to kind of uh, jump straight into the the center of the page and and keep going, um, that's that's our Lamer Uh So there's a lot of destinations. Um, and we can see that the modes that are accommodated here, you've got a lot of people driving um, personal vehicles as well as large trucks. Uh, there's transit, uh, bus lanes, a uh, bus, bus stop, um, pedestrians. There's also likely people biking, but um, perhaps sticking to the sidewalk, or at least I know I would in this instance. Um, so while it's a notable difference from our North Carolina example, um, we can still see it's a rather car dominated space. Uh, so the city decided to redo it. Uh, they decided that the purpose of people's visits and activities on the street were really better suited to prioritizing pedestrian and bicycle traffic. And so in our after, that's exactly what we see uh, is a space, a space that's much more conducive to cyclists and pedestrians, uh, which is supported by the street design. Uh, we can see that in sort of the, the red paved uh, bikeway as well as the, the shared space um, plaza with the brick pavers really catering to pedestrians. Uh, so in this area, cars and delivery vehicles are also allowed, uh, but they would very much be considered guests in this space. Uh, they would need to kind of fall in line behind um, people, uh, behind active transportation folks. Uh, so all of these elements um, that we, we see in this image lend themselves to a more intuitive design for the, for the context around it. Um, so I, I would say that now this, uh, the street and the, and the area around it are, are now telling the same story. All right, so let's, uh, jump into multimodal networks. Um, the first thing I want us to do is, is take a few seconds and think about a complete street. What sort of comes to mind for you when I say complete street? Uh, so on on the next slide we see at least what comes to mind for me when uh, when sort of initially I'm asked to think of a complete street. You know, as as North Americans, I won't speak for everyone, but uh, most people, myself and most people I know, certainly took the idea that every street could be a complete street, and we ran with it and we came up with something like this. Uh, and it's it's a good looking street. Uh, you know, it's the idea that the streets are for everyone. Um, they're designed and operated to enable safe access for all users, pedestrians, cyclists, motorists, uh, transit riders of all ages and abilities. Um, in, on this sort of ideal, amazing street, buses run on time and it's safe for people to walk to and from train stations. Um, so yeah, a sort of basic image of a complete street might look something like this. Um, the risk though, I think when we run into a lack of funding or a shift in local leadership, um, is that our complete street might end up looking something more like this uh, billboard where it says every lane is a bike lane, please share the road. And I'm gonna go out on a loan and suggest that if a sign has to be billboard size, bikes probably should not be on this road and every lane should probably not be a bike lane. Uh, I will say this is not Canada. I trust that y'all would not do something like this. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's a good reminder that a good sign does not make up for a bad design. So this this is a, a rather extreme example, of course, um, but on the less extreme side, what we often end up with is um, a, a Swiss Army knife street, you know, something that tries to solve all of our transportation problems, but does a pretty average or, or subpar job of it. So what we're seeing is a competition for space, and we're seeing this as a result of increases in population, um, increases in the types of modes on our streets. Uh, and I think this demand for a street that can do everything is, is not going to go away. Um, so in trying to create a street for all of these different uh, modes, even just in this picture here, we can see uh, modes and trip purposes. You know, we can see the parent 
uh, taking their kid well, guests to, to daycare, we can see someone who might be a tourist, we can see someone on a moped sharing that lane. Um, so in trying to create a street for, for all of these people, we end up with a street that's really not very nice for any of them. Uh, so I think it can be important and helpful to ask ourselves, sort of complete for whom? Um, if we, to answer that question, we can take a step back and again, look at what are the surrounding land uses, what types of trips are gonna be generated from here and who actually needs access to this space? Um, I think one of the best first questions is, does this really need to be a truck route? Um, so I, I wanna introduce you all to a research program we've been uh, working on in the Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's in partnership with the Dutch equivalent of the CAA. I've, I like to frame it as sort of a Vision Zero 2.0 where it takes all of these foundational principles behind Vision Zero or safe system approach and looks at how we can sort of safely manage all of these um, new competing demands and subsequent conflicts on our streets. So with a, a proactive approach to safety as the starting point, uh, we had a wide variety of modes that were charted based on their mass and maximum speed. And so in this research project, one thing that stood out to us um, is that uh, active transportation and transit have a really natural connection. You know, as, as transportation professionals, we want to think they go hand in hand. Um, but if we're thinking about safety, it's actually a quite difficult connection. Um, so on the on the next slide, we see the uh, that these start to they're starting to become groups of we'll call them modal families um, based on their kinetic energy. So we see the active modes are concentrated on the left half of the table and the heavier um, trucks and transit oriented modes are on the right half. Uh, so indicating that they have this quite high difference in kinetic energy, um, which can be a, a challenging combination uh, and a potentially dangerous combination. So uh, on our next slide, we kind of we kind of graph this out uh, a little bit more cleanly. We've got our modal families on the left hand column, um, starting with pedestrian oriented, bicycle oriented, etc. And then following each of those are the forms and activities that each of those modal families can take. Uh, and then their their maximum speeds are are across the top. So where, where I think this gets interesting though is in determining when it's safe to mix modal families in an urban environment um, and when they should be separated. So on the on the next slide, in this instance, we'll sort of consider the bicycle family as the normative design family. Um, so here we can see that it's safe for pedestrians to mix with bicycles. Their kinetic energy isn't, isn't different enough to, to create um, uh, uh, serious conflicts. Heavier vehicles can be permitted, uh, but they must adhere to speeds that are set by that bicycle oriented traffic. So approximately 20 kilometers an hour. Now, each of these sort of speed based traffic environments are sort of zero, one, two, three, four, five at the top um, come with a bit of a prescribed design. So, for example, if we're prioritizing the bicycle family, it might look something um, like this. Uh, this is a street catered to bicycles. Uh, cars and small delivery vehicles would still be allowed, uh, but it's clear through the posted speed, the um, the materials used, the narrowness of the roadway, uh, that those vehicles would be a guest in this bicycle space. Um, it's also quite intuitive that pedestrians would be allowed here. So then let's look at heavier motor vehicles. So car oriented families are gonna be the heaviest designed vehicle that we'll see in the built up environment. And by that, I mean urban and suburban. Uh, so with the car family as the normative uh, design, the posted and operating speeds should not be higher than 50 kilometers an hour. And in these traffic environments that cater to the car, uh, we can see that the truck and transit families, they're permitted on these roads, um, but they must behave as a guest in the space, much like the car in the, in the bicycle space. So even if it's a truck route, the design of the road must indicate or sort of force the acknowledgement that they're in a built up area now, which then becomes the domain of the other vehicles. Uh, so in this instance, light motor vehicle families may also mix on the road. 
um, and all active modes must be fully separated. All right, so let's let's see what this one looks like on street. Uh, so here we can see, even though there are accommodations for uh, for active transportation, it's clear that it's a car oriented space. Um, there's sort of I'll, I'll highlight five kind of key points here um, to uh, to highlight how conflicts between active transportation road users and heavier vehicles, including transit, are minimized. So at our speeds up to 50k. Uh, we see the intersections are protected, so our room for conflict is, is really minimized. Uh, we see that at the signalized intersections, right turns on red would not be permitted. Uh, there'd be dedicated phasing. Uh, so not only are active transportation user, uh, road users separated by space, they're also separated by time. And then this one is uh, perhaps obvious, but along the corridor, bicycles and pedestrians would be on a grade separated cycle track or protected bike lane with a buffer. Uh, the fourth point is that access management is really gonna be key on these corridors. Uh, so with turning movements, ideally only happening at intersections, whether that's onto a smaller road or, or a driveway. And last but not least is that speeds higher than 50 kilometers an hour in the built up area. Um, in the Dutch context, this uh, probably wouldn't happen. Uh, in the North American context, I think it, it uh, is likely to happen. Um, so if uh, should it happen that speeds are higher than 50K in the built up area, uh, active transportation would not be permitted to share that space in any way. Um, so if the decision were made to maintain a higher speed limit, uh, then bikes and peds would just need a an alternate uh, parallel fully fully separate route. Um, so we're really just dipping our toes here into the uh, this research program that has evolved to become known as the Good Street. Um, I'm, we're happy to share more information on this approach. Uh, we've got um, I've had a few discussions around it on Mobicon Academy, which we're happy to share a link for uh, later. Uh, but for now, I want to jump down to uh, San Diego, California, and look at that as an example of applying this methodology in the planning phase. <clears throat> All right, South Bay to Sorrento. So this is a major corridor in the San Diego region. Uh, it's approximately 50 kilometers from the northernmost beige point on this map uh, down to the U.S.-Mexico border. And what we're looking at on this map are uh, the regional transit lines. Now what the region is doing is they're moving ahead with sort of next generation transportation solutions from these uh, smart transportation, uh, smart transit corridors to micro mobility and everything in between. And so this is one of the key corridors in the plan. And on the next slide, what we'll see are um, these, these blobs are what they're calling mobility hubs. Um, so the mobility hubs are uh, basically areas near major residential job and activity centers. Um, so along this corridor, there are lots of pockets of kind of high density populations and destinations. Uh, and of course, if we were to overlay the transit lines with this, the mobility hubs would follow along with those transit lines. Um, so the idea is that each mobility hub features a, a very full suite of transportation options. Um, so in addition to our, our more traditional options like buses, trains, and um, cycling and walking. They also include uh, bike share, e-bike share, car bike share, e-scooter share, just get all the shares, um, micro transit, neighborhood electric vehicles, um, not to mention dynamic parking strategies. So anyways, as soon as we saw this list of all the different types of modes of transportation they were working towards, uh, we knew that these modes would, would need some organizing. Their roads are notably wide, uh, but they're still not going to be wide enough to accommodate uh, the population in, in this region, as well as all of those different modes all at once. Um, so yeah, on this slide, we'll zoom into a, a more digestible graphic. Uh, here, the blue would be the mobility hub. Uh, the red would be that sort of primary transit corridor, the 50-kilometer one. And then the green are sort of supporting connectors between mobility hubs into the transit line. So if we're thinking, if we're going back to our, our Good Street research project and, and thinking about our modal families, uh, with our blue mobility hubs here, um, this is a sort of built up area. We'd really have an emphasis on active transportation and, and lighter, lighter modes here. 
Uh, so this would largely be slow streets where bicycle and pedestrians um, families are the dominant family. And then the red connector um, outside of the blue mobility hub um, with the with the dashed white line. This is where we would see, you know, transit. Uh, you could prioritize transit here. This is full speed ahead uh, above and beyond 50 kilometers an hour. Um, and this is where you would not see active transportation. It should not be along this corridor, but rather on a separate route. As the red connector enters the mobility hub, however, this is where that uh, transit line should slow down to ideally 30 kilometers um, an hour, 50 kilometers at most, given you can still kind of separate the modes from it. Uh, so we'll look at uh, one of the examples of a mobility hub in the, uh, the bicycle network that was developed for it. So this is an example from Imperial Beach. This was the southern side of San Diego. Uh, the pinkish purple um, blob is the mobility hub. So again, high density, lots of mobility, bike ped focus. Um, the, the green is the our enhanced service areas. So this is where they feature kind of smaller connectors, local transit, bike share hubs. Uh, and then the orange lines are rapid transit. And then the commuter rail, that, that main transit corridor, in the in the dark red is is off to the right and then on our so that's just to kind of uh give us a sense of where we are here uh before we jump into even more lines on the map um so the the dash lines are the are the planned bicycle network and what jumps out to me on this page are all of the brown lines and the brown dash lines are um these are recommended as bicycle boulevards so very very calm. Again, the, the bicycle family is the dominant family. Your max speed is going to be around uh, 20 kilometers an hour. Um, so there, uh, so the second thing I want to highlight here, and I'll, I'll close off my section with this, is that the brown lines, you'll see they're punctuated by um, sort of interspersed magenta lines. And these are these are the corridors that have been identified for, um, for really moving traffic through a little more quickly rather than being your main access roads. Um, so these will feature a little more of your complete street atmosphere, the, the image we, uh, we talked about at the beginning. Um, but you'll note that these are kind of restricted to just a, a handful of key corridors. Um, and I, I think what this does is that it, it results in, what it does is that it results in basically all of the space between these um, dash magenta lines um, being quite traffic calmed. So uh, so you're just getting this this very sort of calm environment, uh, calm transportation environment. It's, you know, a lot of people, a lot of different modes still, but they're all at that, um, mo most of the streets are at that quite, quite slow pace, um, which will create that, that more pleasant um, environment. So I'll, I'm going to pass to Wayne now, and he's going to show us some of the on-the-ground elements that uh, help contribute to a uh, multimodal street. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, I hope everyone can hear me um, clearly. Um, and then next, I'm going to um, share some nitty-gritties of the infrastructure aspect of this um, um, multimodal integration. Um, so there's so many tools and measures that constitute a multimodal integration. Um, they can look quite overwhelming, right? Um, and in fact, they can be summarized into um, three big categories. Um, the first one would be hardware, um, such as building up bicycle infrastructure. Um, the second is software, um, like establishing policies, um, data collections, and developing programmings. And the last one is sometimes um, people uh, often overlook is the peopleware like fostering a good um, active transportation cultures and having political wills. And for the rest of my slides, um, my focus would be to share some examples of the hardware ingredients for uh, bike train integration. Now let's take a look at this figure um, showing the Dutch mode share by distance. Um, it's very interesting to see that the red line um, that represents cars and the green line that represents bike and moped um, intersects at about four kilometer um, distance. And that tells us that um, even in the Netherlands, cars become more attractive than bicycle uh, for trips longer than four kilometers. And that is the metric number that can be applied in North America. Uh, and meaning that uh, we can do a lot um, to facilitate short trips by active transportation and create a 15 minute community. And then longer distance trips 
can be achieved by having a train uh, a trip training and combining active transportation and rapid transit. And the first ingredient for uh, bike train integration is to strengthen our connection between home and transit center and from transit center to our final destination. In addition to a complete and functional active transportation network, like Mary has described, uh, making sure our facilities are suitable for all ages and abilities is imperative. And this, in this Dutch example, um, the street is compact, uh, but mighty. Um, its typology is um, equivalent to uh, a major collector or a minor urban arterial um, in the Canadian um, standard. Um, maybe similar to uh, 100 Avenue um, um, in downtown Edmonton, I'm guessing. Um, this kind of street typically has design speeds um, for cars at 40 km per hour and having a separate um, bike lane behind the parked cars. Um, and having a parallel sidewalk on the side. Um, you, can, you can notice the signature Dutch red ash for, uh, on the cycle track. Um, and also parking is accommodated um, in the parking bays um, with the greenery between the cycle path and the parking bay. And that enhances a narrow wheel for cars and therefore um, tempering the driving speed on, on the road. And we know a network is as strong as the weakest link. And on average, uh, four out of five collisions uh, happen at intersections. So improving intersection safety is critical to making cycling a feasible transport alternative. A protected intersection is a common design feature in the Netherlands, and they are popping up in Canada in recent years. And I'll come back to its design in the next few slides. Um, another example of sustainable safety uh, is reflected in roundabout designs and their designs are context sensitive. Um, in rural and suburban um, area in the Netherlands, vehicles have the priority. Um, and then in build up areas, right of way is given to cyclists and pedestrians at roundabout crossings. Nonetheless, um, they both feature the radial um, geometric design um, and having a center refuge island at the pedestrian bicycle crossing um, to boost safety. If you want to make cycling as attractive as driving, uh, wayfinding is something you cannot miss. In the Netherlands, um, the key bike routes are numbered and wayfinding signage are installed at the crossroads to guide cyclists to, the to their destinations, um, such as the hospital here and, uh, and train stations and telling how far the distance they are from. And now uh, let's take a look at Main Street in Ottawa. And this is a before construction picture showing a typical uh, bowling boring four-wing car-centric arterial. Um, so Main Street is designated as a spine cycling route, but had no cycling facility at all. And Mobicon supported the complete street redesign in 2015. And this is the after construction picture. Um, you can see um, we had a road diet and introduction of cycle track. And that provides a physical um, alternative for local residents and cross-town cyclists. P um, even though a travel lane is removed, um, but the people moving capacity has actually increased. Um, also, cyclists are more willing to make multiple stops um, to shop during their commute. So local businesses are thriving. With the additional landscaping and public arts, um, it, forces, um, it fosters a sense of community in the area. Um, Ottawa did a pilot project for its first protected bike lane um, along Laurier Avenue in 2015. And Mobicon was retained by the city to conduct a uh, roadway safety audit on uh, following best practices in the Netherlands. One of our key recommendations, um, among many others, um, is to find opportunities to upgrade any conventional intersections to a fully protected intersection. And nowadays, there are over a dozen protected intersections um, that have been built in the city. And some designs are very compact, like what we see in the picture here in city center. And many other protected intersections are built in a suburban context um, along the key cycling routes. And the beauty of this protected intersection is that um, they can be built first to address the intersection safety before the entire corridor gets its upgrade to have a higher class of bicycle facility. You can see in this picture um, the how um, the protected intersection is transitioned back to a, uh, a conventional painted bike lane. Um, just before and after uh, the channelization um, for the uh, protecting section. 
And for more information about um, designing a proper protecting section, um, that will probably take another webinar to explain. So I, I will post a webinar link um, um, about the Pacific if um, um, the audience is interested. And then wind fighting. Um, there are a lot more, um, there are more present now along parkways and bike trails in Ottawa and over the past few years. Um, and something unique here is uh, the ski and LRT integration. And I'm sure that can be also achieved once the very line LRT opens in Edmonton. Um, and then the next ingredient for uh, a good bike train integration is the bike parking, is providing bike parking and amenities. And this is the center station um, in Utrecht, uh, located in the center of the Netherlands. Um, and this train station is the busiest in the country. And under the train station, that houses the world's largest bike garage uh, with a capacity to, um, to store up, up to 12,500 bicycles. And that's because 40% of the visitors uh, arrive to the station on bicycles. Um, so other than the two tier bike carriers, the carriers that you can see in the picture on the left side of the picture uh, to improve storage um, capacity, um, it has also considered uh, providing um, parking spots for cargo bikes. Also bike sharing is uh, a standard services um, offered by the Dutch National Rail Company. And the share bikes is called OV feeds, which means um, public transport bike. A total of 22,500 of them are available to rent across 300 train stations in the country. And renting OV feed is very easy. Um, with the transit smart car people use to access trains or trams, it can be used to rent these um, shared bicycles. And that offers an alternative to taxi and Uber uh, once people get off a foreign train station and need to get to a further destination. Um, in 2020 alone, over 3 million rides were registered. And now let's take a look at Ottawa uh, for comparison. And the picture is showing Herman Station, and that's part of the Confederation Line LRT open in 2019. Um, this station is also a transit hub where people can make transfers between LRT, BRT, and other local bus services. Uh, what I wanted to mention here is the weatherproof bicycle parking under the platform roof uh, on either side. Um, and it's not the scale of parking that we see in the Netherlands, but still, um, um, there's a lot of room for, uh, for expansion. And also on the other side of the train station, there's some um, overflow bike parking. And you can also see the security camera uh, on the right edge of the picture, um, just for increased security. If you don't want to uh, leave your bikes at the station, um, it's completely fine that you can bring your bikes onto the train any time of the day. And the stations are designed to make uh, walking your bike from the entrance to the platform easier. Um, measures include like runnels that you can walk your bike up and down the stairs and also has elevators that is, has enough, enough space uh, for bicycles and other mobile devices um, to load and unload. Um, also, um, it features a wider fare gate at the end um, of each row um, to allow people to bring the bicycle or other like wheelchairs to enter into the platform. And last, I would like to highlight how a seamless transition between bicycle and train would look like. Um, and this is a typical um, bicycle pedestrian underpass uh, in the Netherlands. So it allows people to travel to and from the train station, but also through the station. And you can notice the slope coming out of the underpass is quite smooth and gentle. Um, and now let's take a look at this uh, video clip um, in Ottawa. Um, we test run the video, it might be jumpy, but uh, I'll try my best. So this is how the Dutch concept plays out in Ottawa. And as we are approaching um, north to the U Ottawa uh, LRT station. This is part of the Confederation Line LRT. And you can see um, the service texture has changed. Um, so to indicate this is more pedestrian priority. Um, and now you can see the um, bicycle parking on either side. The left side um, has a shelter and the right side is open air, um, very, uh, very close to the LRT platform. And the LRT entirety corridor has great separation from um, 
or, or other modes of traffic. So meaning uh, it improves the efficiency um, for the LRT that allow to have a, a four minute headway and also have the opportunity to shorten to 90 seconds if needed. And now on the left side that we see a circular bike ramp. Um, I mean, it does not enjoy, I mean, because of the space constraint, uh, a straight and um, a straightforward ramp would not be possible here, but giving the gentle uh, um, slope um, is, can, is still a, a quite amazing experience to uh, travel up and down um, and, through the, <clears throat> and through the LRT station. And you can see the, um, the stairs are on the left side of this uh, circular ramp, so to provide a shortcut if people on foot. And under the underpass, you can see a couple of the different texture and colors. Um, the left side is for pedestrian traffic, and then the right side is for um, um, bicycles to follow the, the good street approach. And then um, also see the public uh, art on either side of the tunnel, just um, provides uh, a better sense of security, giving the extra eyes on the, on the in public space. Now we get to this um, bicycle actuated signal, and what we're facing us is the Riddle Canal, and and now we're getting up onto uh, the pedestrian bridge, and the, and and that connects to Somerset Street, a major east-west uh, corridor um, to connect university campus to um, to the center town uh, neighborhood, which has a lot more uh, residential housings, uh, amenities, and shopping services, etc. Um, yeah, and then here we are biking across the canal, and the canal now is frozen. is now is the biggest, um, what it says, is the worst, largest uh, skating ring in the world. Uh, yeah, so you can literally take the chain and come to skate if you need to. And yeah, oops. And that is about it for the presentation. And thank you so much for having um, myself and Mary at, um, at the webinar. And we are welcoming any questions. Hey, thank you so much for Mary and Wayne. And uh, this is a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, as this for myself personally, I, I just learned a lot, especially um, when um, Mary introduced uh, some like uh, history of this multimodal um, related topic. And also Wayne shared a lot of good examples from the Netherlands why, uh, side and also the good examples in Ottawa, especially the last uh, video is very impressive. So I. I just appreciate um, both of you to share. This is a great story um, to our uh, committee members, um, our local community uh, for NACIT. So let's uh, go to check some uh, uh, questions and uh, definitely feel free. If you have more questions, please leave that in the, the chat box. Um, I see the one question from Christy and um, uh, I noticed that both of your example uh, in the Netherlands and the complicity have a dedicated space for cyclists, but not uh, transit. How can we bring transit into the equation? So anyone can answer that? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, and then Wayne, you can add anything I miss as well. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the question, Christy. I think the, the first thing that came to mind is that um, in the sort of more urban areas, uh, we're largely leaning away from creating those dedicated spaces for transit, um, also to sort of uh, discourage their their speeds from from getting up too high. Uh, so the sort of more dedicated spaces uh, you would see more often on the um, sort of higher speed transit throughways where you wouldn't necessarily um, see uh, see people cycling. Um, there is an example that I don't know if I can uh, share my screen or not. Um, of a, a tram line redesign. Um, okay, it doesn't look like I can, but uh, if I get permission to uh, to share screen, then <clears throat> excuse me, I will. But oh my goodness. Uh, anyways, uh, so a tram line going through, but what the going through a sort of urban built up uh, uh, area, and so the the line is very the sort of taken as many efforts as they can to traffic calm the space. So it's a grassy tram line. They do have um, uh, people cycling and driving, uh, people driving at very slow speeds adjacent to it. Um, but sort of taking all of those efforts to get the speed down to, you know, in between um, 20 and, and 30 kilometers an hour. Oh, I'm being told I can present this. 
Um, Wayne, do you have anything to add while I'm figuring out how I can share my screen here? Sure, Mary. Um, I think in principle, we would like to um, follow that good street approach. It's just given the fact that um, if you're talking about uh, buses and that would be in the same category as um, heavy vehicles, right? And then if we want to go for a rapid transit, and being the fact that it would has a much larger kinetic energy, so that like such as having an LRT or a BRT, um, and that would require a separate uh, suite of infrastructure, um, separate from um, active transportation facilities. Uh, yeah, thanks. It, I think it's my computer. It's um, not. Go to meeting. Uh, anyways, we'll be happy, happy to follow up with some pictures uh, after the fact. Okay, thank you for the question. And definitely, like uh, our uh, webinar will be uploaded to our NACIT's uh, YouTube channel. And uh, definitely, uh, anybody will come to follow up after this webinar. And you can find the contact from Mary and Wayne if you want to contact them uh, after today's webinar. And let's see the next question uh, from Tony. And uh, what changes to our ex existing already urban sprout cities can be made to make active transportation more attractive to those who live in suburbs, especially? those whose uh, destination is not downtown. I, I, I think I can speak about that, and Mary, you can jump in if you need to. Um, I think the city of Edmonton is taking a very good approach um, uh, by um, doing neighborhood renewal. And so it's a more holistic approach to not only um, renew the existing um, rural infrastructure, but addressing any missing gaps in the active transportation network within the neighborhood. And, and I think, like I, I mentioned in the, um, in the presentation, like how can we uh, facilitate environment for any trip that's shorter than four kilometer and that people would like to um, walk or take, um, or take their bike um, to, to, reach those, to reach those local destinations would be quite important. Yeah, and then for a longer distance trips, um, I think um, um, if people still need to, to, um, to drive, that is completely okay, but uh, giving the, uh, the RT expansion and that can uh, really integrate it with the active transportation in the neighborhood to to um, to finish a longer distance trips. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. I'll I'll also add in one of the shifts that we're seeing is um, with the emergence of the e-bike. Um, if uh, one could actually get their hands on one at this point, um, is that sort of where you see in urban areas those kind of very dense local active transportation networks, the e-bike is sort of helping to expand that network. Um, so it's it's more comfortable to uh, to bike longer distances, um, which I think with good, uh, uh, most likely separated facilities in suburban areas, um, that kind of combination of, of separated infrastructure and um, yeah, e-bikes is, is one way to go about it. Thanks a lot. And I think next one, uh, we just shared the record uh, recorded protect intersection webinar, and uh, everybody can follow that link. And next question is from Maso. Um, um, I really like using kinetic uh, energy to group and model families and how to design for traffic environmental depending on speed. Is this available uh, elsewhere? And also, Barry mentioned that the Mobi Concourse seminar is uh, there's a link for that. Uh, both good questions, and I believe the answer is yes to both of them, and we can include those in a follow-up. Mary, okay. can we share that um, YouTube link that with a um, whole bunch of videos in the chat? Uh, yes, that or a, I don't know if there's an opportunity to send a follow-up email, um, mm -hmm. just if we can. Uh, yeah, I Sounds good. And uh, yeah, we still have four minutes. I just were trying to cover as much as possible the, the question. Next one, uh, any comments on bike theft um, being in the inhibitor to share the facilities? I think it's a really interesting one. Yeah. Any thoughts? Um, my first thought is that yes, it happens a lot. I thought it was quite an interesting picture uh, walking around in the Netherlands and seeing all of these massive uh, bike locks that probably cost more than uh, than the bike itself. Um, so definitely, theft is definitely an issue. Um, Wayne, do you want to uh, comment more on that? Okay. 
Okay, thanks. Not a while, um, there are those bike secure bike secure officers um, where people can um, can request a, a fob from the city and and pay a rent um, pay a monthly rental fee um, to have a dedicated um, space and secure space um, for for bike for bicycle storage um, near transit centers. Yes, definitely. Um, next question from Ryan. Further to the suburban question, have you identified the multimodal cycling optimum uh, distance that an average person is willing to commute, as well as a uh, temperature, weather, tolerance? This is based on probably the, some case in Edmonton, which uh, is like a winter city here. I don't know that we've ever scaled the distance um, by temperature, but that would be that would be an interesting one. Um, I know with uh, the Dutch communities we work in, uh, they talk, I mean, where I am, we talk a lot about heat uh, and mountains and the Netherlands, they talk a lot about that we have to accommodate for uh, for wind and, and how much that affects the, the commute. Um, uh, for commute, my, what's coming to mind is uh, four miles. Um, so thinking about seven kilometers, is that Wayne, what you've got in mind as well? Not scaled for temperature. Um, I think lots of people who would not um, realize is that when we um, go for uh, alpine skiing or alpine snowboarding and and and, and on those uh, high altitudes, um, the the, temp the temperature or how you feel about the environment um, is not as harsh as um, described um, according to the weather the weather forecast. So um, I mean, once you get your body moving, um, um, the um, the the sub-zero temperature is 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 manageable, and I mean, there's a saying that there's um, no bad um, temperature, just bad clothing. And of course, the city need to uh, ramp up the um, the winter maintenance operation to make sure the facility is safe for um, for active travel. Okay, thanks, Wayne. And uh, next one from Justin. Uh, cities you showed are uh, mostly white collar workers uh, whose job destination is typically in um, office. How would this change for communities where there's more blue collar uh, workers who don't work in office? Yeah, thank you, Justin. That's a great question. Um, I think this is maybe more a comment on our need to diversify our pictures a little bit and show some more, um, some less white collar spaces. I, I don't think it would um, change it in the Netherlands across um, all different types of uh, communities and, and uh, districts, um, the, the planning is the same, yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably the last question. I see some comments here, but definitely I think we will see that from our um, record, recorded uh, webinar uh, from YouTube in the future. And uh, now I would like to uh, wrap up our today's uh, webinar. And thank you so much for our two outstanding speakers from Mobicon. And definitely, I personally follow Mobicon for, for a while, and I just learned a lot of uh, interesting information about uh, the company and also some good experience from the Europe, etc., like the Netherlands cases. And um, definitely, um, we would like to uh, the, uh, thank you to our uh, outstanding speakers and definitely anybody want to connect to Mobicon and our speakers, uh, feel free by checking their um, you know, uh, contacts um, in the presentation. And I wish everyone, uh, every attendees today have a great day and the rest of your week. And thank you so much.